Scientists refer to ocean acidification as the other carbon problem. The first, of course, is global warming. People have heard about global warming for years, but it's only over the past five years that experts really understood that the carbon dioxide is causing a problem for the oceans as well. And what's worrisome is it hasn't even been on our radar. Carbon dioxide pollution is transforming the chemistry of the ocean, rapidly making the water more acidic. In decades, rising ocean acidity may challenge life on a scale that has not occurred for tens of millions of years. So we confront an urgent choice to move beyond fossil fuels or to risk turning the ocean into a sea of weeds. When we burn coal, oil, and gas, we introduce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But the atmosphere touches the ocean over 70% of Earth's surface. So this carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere, we are also putting into the ocean. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, exists naturally in our atmosphere. Plants need it to grow. Animals exhale it in every breath. But carbon dioxide is also a byproduct of burning fossil fuels. And in large amounts, it is a dangerous pollutant. Since the Industrial Revolution, the ocean has absorbed roughly one quarter of the carbon dioxide produced by burning fuels. Scientists once thought this beneficial. After all, that carbon dioxide would otherwise accelerate global warming. But what happens when so much carbon dioxide, 22 million tons of it each day, mixes with ocean water? In terms of chemistry, the answer is simple. It becomes an acid. Since the Industrial Revolution, the ocean acidity has increased by 30%. With mathematical models, scientists have demonstrated that if we continue to pollute as we are now, the ocean acidity will double by the end of the century compared to pre-industrial times. That is a big problem. Scientists only recently stopped to think about what this would mean for life in the ocean. Thousands of ocean species build protective shells to survive. Some are so prolific, they can be seen from space. These organisms create their shells, which can be paper thin, by drawing certain molecules from the water around them. But rising acidity depletes those molecules. So by removing the essential building block for shell formation, it, it's making the organisms work a lot harder to build their shells, and that means they have less energy to get food, they have less energy to reproduce, and eventually the organism can no longer compete ecologically. The surprise is how sensitive some marine organisms are to this increased acidity from carbon dioxide. And when acidity gets too high, shells dissolve. We're changing the basic rules of everything. And because of that, a lot of organisms may not be able to survive. Already, we've seen water showing up off the coast of Northern California that's acidic enough to start actually dissolving seashells. It's thought that this kind of corrosive water showing up will become more and more common. Most of the west coast of North America's shellfish, that's Dungeness crabs, lobsters, mussels, oysters, sea urchins, shrimp, all those life forms are at risk. 
By mid-century, if we continue emitting carbon dioxide the way we have been, entire vast areas of both the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean will be so corrosive that it will cause seashells to dissolve. Scientific models show that in just a few decades, we will profoundly alter the ocean's chemistry. Such conditions haven't existed since the extinction of the dinosaurs. Recreating those conditions so quickly could leave many ocean animals unable to adapt. What if shellfish could no longer build shells? Would they cease to exist? Perhaps. Shelled creatures such as corals and plankton play a key role in the ocean food web. Pteropods are a kind of plankton that live all around the world and in great abundance in polar waters. Pteropods are especially vulnerable. There's growing alarm that higher acidity will extinguish creatures like pteropods that are a basic food source for fish. In many parts of the world, fish are a basic food source for people. So you can't just worry about the big things in the ocean, you have to worry about what they eat. And where their food comes from. If the smallest things in the ocean are affected by ocean acidification, then it ripples all the way up the food web making the largest things in the ocean even more in danger. As individual strands disappear, the entire food web becomes weaker, more vulnerable, less beneficial to humankind. Marine life that might withstand warming temperatures or rising acidity may succumb when confronted by both. Coral reefs already struggle to survive in warming waters. Rising ocean acidity puts them in double jeopardy. We know that coral reefs are particularly sensitive to ocean acidification. And the reason for that is that corals are unable to form their skeletons as quickly as they used to, and reefs are starting to crumble and disappear. We may lose those ecosystems within 20 or 30 years. And in those structures live a, an estimated million species. One in every four species in the ocean lives on a coral reef. We've got the last decade in which we can do something about this problem. But it's very, very clear that if we don't start to deal with it right now with very, very stern cuts to emissions, we are going to condemn oceans to an extremely uncertain future. When people say it was high CO2 100 million years ago, so we have nothing to worry about, that high CO2 was achieved over a slow process of millions of years. And if we achieve high CO2 over millions of years, the Earth will be able to handle it. If we achieve high CO2 over decades, the ocean is in big trouble. Earth is the only planet we know of where life exists. To understand our own actions, we sometimes need to view them in a larger context. Planet Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago. Three and a half billion years ago, life began. 250 million years ago, dinosaurs appeared. And 200,000 years ago, Homo sapiens. Within that framework, human civilization is brand new. Our industrial society, but an instant. Yet in that instant, we have altered the course of nature. We have heated the Earth's surface, acidified its oceans, and consumed much of its natural habitat. Now, 
something extraordinary looms. A mass extinction of animals and plants, caused not by volcanic eruption or the collision of a meteor, but by the actions of one species, ours. The only way to stop acidification is to emit less carbon dioxide. Our industrial revolution began more than two centuries ago. Technology has advanced rapidly since then, but we still make energy as we have for hundreds of thousands of years by setting things on fire. Often, we squander the energy we make. Using more than necessary to accomplish our goals, but now we know how to use energy more efficiently, how to do more with less. There was a time when people thought about energy efficiency and conservation as sacrifice, doing without, dark homes, shuttered economies. That is emphatically not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting dramatically more work out of less energy with better technology. Those energy efficiency solutions are particularly promising because the whole world will want to adopt them. If we take that initial step, we will also, in addition to reducing carbon pollution, have the very welcome dividend、uh, in the form of economic stimulus because we'll, we'll be reducing energy bills. We know how to capture energy cleanly from sunlight, wind, tides, and the heat of the Earth's core. Imagine that you're living in a house that gets some of its electricity from its own solar panels, feeds some of that back into your own vehicle when it's plugged in at night. Provides you with energy services, and maybe this is the most important single piece of it.、Uh, at costs below those you're paying now, that double dividend was never more needed by the U.S. and world economy than it is right now. We are on the verge of a green industrial revolution, a revolution that will expand our economy, protect our resources, and give us real energy independence. There is much we don't know about how carbon pollution will affect our world. Still, we have to choose. We can go on as we have, forcing future generations to survive somehow, without the vast ocean resources that have sustained us. Or, we can move beyond fossil fuels, securing a future that works for all of us, for all living things. What will we choose?